Okay, today we're going to look at uh, Caucasian evidence and traces of Caucasian type people that are actually in pre-Columbian America before the Spaniards ever showed up. Clearly we know that we've lost a lot of their information. It all got destroyed because they were pagans and things like that supposedly, but of what evidence we do have, there's a lot of telltale signs that show you that there is some type of Caucasoid presence here in the Americas. Light-skinned and bearded gods, when the conquistadors led by Francisco Pizarro first encountered the Incas, they were greeted as gods. Viracochas, because of their lighter skin and beards, resembled that of a divine race of people which had previously lived there a long time ago, and then had left the progenitors. Also, the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl and several other deities from Central and South American pantheons are described in legends as being white, bearded men. We've seen that through time. You see it all the way up in even to the Americas, but they were master masons. When the Spaniards came to Lake Titicaca up on the Andes, they found the mightiest ruins of all South America, Tiwanaku. They saw a hill reshaped by men into a stepped pyramid classical masonry of the enormous blocks beautifully dressed and fitted together and enormous large stone statues in human forms. They asked the Indians to tell them who had left these enormous ruins and who had built them. The well-known chronicler Caiza de Leon was told in reply that these things had been made long before the Incas came to power. They were made by white and bearded men like the Spaniards themselves. And here we have that megalithic stonework that's all locked together and strange shaped. Now, Contiki Viracocha, the white men, had finally abandoned their statues and gone with the leader, Contiki Viracocha. First up to Cusco and then down to the Pacific, they were given the Inca name of Viracocha, or sea foam, because they were white skinned and vanished from this uh, world like the foam on the sea. The conquistador, Pedro Pizarro, reported that while the masses of Indians were small and dark-skinned, or tanned, the members of the Inca family were tall and light-skinned. When Pizarro asked who the white-skinned redheads were, the Inca Indians replied that they were the last descendants of the original Veracochas. This odd depiction is from the Codex Vaticanus. Many of these depictions show a lighter skinned man, like in the sacrifice just shown there and here, and these people here. It's a strange thing to see these two forms showing up in the same art together letting you know there's a radical difference between the two. Much like in Egypt, where you do see some of the Nubians and things around are darker skinned people, but then a lot lighter skinned. Other traces of Caucasian types elements through pre-Inca Peru also. Specimens like these hair samples that are found from the original mummies are there. And they're the, apparently the pre-Inca uh, high culture at the Nazca coast. And you look at these and they have blonde and red hair. And they've analyzed all this and it's not changed over time. And I guess one proof of that is that there are dark brown and black haired people, red headed people, blonde, very blonde, sandy blonde, dirty blonde hair, people that are all over. So you can still see them into the day in these burials and you can see the difference in the colors of these people in this art here. Well, there are darker people whose colors oxidized over time, but the others are painted with a much lighter color. You can see in the sacrifice that was pretty much like the picture at the start of it, that they are sacrificing one of the gods or one of the people that were not. And you look at these bearded men and gods that they have. And, uh, you know, this is from Copan, Honduras. And these bearded gods that are here, all over. Moshe bottles, 
Moshe is an odd name to have for these because Moshe is Moses' name, but now this is neat here. This is the Stella of 18 Rabbit. It's a, uh, him as an old man. A lot of the other depictions are him as a virile person. It's in Copan Honduras, but his name is 18 Rabbit, and the rabbits they're describing are ones that are from definitely in North America. Look at this red-headed person here. A lot of these mummies I'm going to show you are from the cemetery at Coquila at Nazca, but preserved red hair. It's not treated with henna or anything. They're, they're redheads. Here's a blonde and auburn-haired. It's an Indian with auburn hair. Long black hair. Brown and auburn. Still on these skulls to this day. A red-headed person. Another deep red-headed or auburn-haired person. Quite striking when you think about it. And there's more artifacts, you know, like Moshe from Nazca, and the Wari, and the Olmec, the Ica, the Kimu, and Inca cultures all show resemblances that show these ancient people. Uh, Wari being one of the main ones that are shown that had the blonde hair themselves. There's a vessel dating from the Sycan period that showed definitely a swastika. Blue-eyed people, funerary, funerary mass, the Wari mummy mass of Peru from 700 AD that I've done in my special of blue-eyed gods before. This is like that lapis lazuli. If you make it wet, they are bright blue colored. They're just all covered with dust right now. They've just pulled it up out of a burial that's right there and that's fresh in 2008. Look at these green eyes too, green-eyed gods. Now the locals don't have this effect with them. They even barely have the effect after Spanish, um, you know, DNA splicing, if you will, uh, during the uh, early conquistador time, whenever they do have some in there and they have the definite admix. So uh, to have all their gods to have green and blue eyes and bearded and things would be just quite an oddity, and I think so. They talk about burying migrations, and they say this is how it came down through the Americas. And so if you have things like that going on, then you would probably glean information off of it. Now, another fundamental implication of Hordick's theory was that a practical and justified was that there should be visible or a clear chronological chain of development along the north-south axis. Cultural remains from North America should be clearly older than those in Central America, and those in turn should be significantly older than the South American ones. In other words, the youngest cultures should be the farthest down in the south, and at any rate, there shouldn't be anything very old in the far south as comparative-wise. That, uh, too, was quite bizarre as a scientific idea, for there is no such clear correlation. For example, if we look at a map of Central America showing the chronological cultures, the following order will emerge. So will it start at, like, more the southern Central America section and the Mayan and Olmecs and start off at the first part of it? And what we see is the Olmecs, which was one of the oldest civilizations there. Uh, the first remains date from about the 12th century B.C. The last one's from around the 1st century B.C. still. They occupied the territory of the southernmost part of Mexico and Guatemala. In the adjacent territory, slightly to the west, emerged in the 5th century B.C. a similar culture called Zapotecs and Mixtecs. It lasted quite a long time and disappeared from the scene around 15th century AD, probably due to the transference of smallpox and things. At the same latitude, or more precisely in the territory occupied earlier by the Olmecs, flourished the Mayan civilization for around a thousand years, beginning in the first century BC, and then the great trek northward began and started to go up out of Panama and the lower Mexican Delta area and uh, the top of uh, South America and came north. Now in the second century AD there appeared the Tehotuacan civilization in central Mexico. It was succeeded by the Toltecs and then the Aztecs who were the youngest at that same time the most northern Central American civilization. The only cultural center today that you can find uh, in the U.S. that possessed a city at the, as the Casa Grandes appeared only in about the 7th century A.D., so almost 2,000 years after the Olmecs in the south, and that shows you something that can't quite correlate together. 
almost 2,000 years after the Omleks were there, there is another civilization. And clearly we can see that there are Indians and North American Indians that are not as advanced as these people are down in the South and they're down in Mexico. So how does this supposedly sport there being a migration from the North down in through to the South? Surely there's a migration down into the South, but it's more of a Eskimo Indian culture that came in and, and infiltrated from the North as there was already these ones in the South. Now, these villages here of the Anasazi is another thing that I've seen personally and stuff. Uh, for over a century, the mysterious reunions of the cliff dwellings in Nevada and elsewhere in the western USA have baffled archaeologists and historians. Square stone structures were foreign to the Amer Indians. And local Indian legends themselves claim that the buildings were first created by a mysterious people called the Anasazi, who were inhabited the area before the American Indians did, that they had merely came in and this was already there. And you can see Anasazi ruins with swastikas all over them too, carrying you back to this primordial time when everybody had this symbol. The buildings are, however, were currently shown off to tourists as American Indian created structures. The American Indians did indeed build these structures. Why would they have been living in buffalo skin tents when the Europeans colored the country, colonized the country in the 1500s. Why would they go from building brick and mud brick structures and squared off housings with windows and turned back? Now there's Kennewick Man, uh, 28th, 1996. A dramatic find was made in the state of Washington in the northwestern United States up there of Kennewick Man. On that day, a well-preserved skeleton was found in the Columbia River Basin in Kennewick. This skeleton has become known as Kennewick Man as a result. The nearly intact skeletal remains found with a stone arrowhead lodged in the pelvic bone are so obviously white that the forensic anthropologists and local police first thought, first thought them to be of a 19th century white male, about 45 years old, who was killed by an arrow, perhaps back in the times of Lewis and Clark. Radiocarbon dating of a finger bone, however, showed that it to have great age of at least 9,000 years old. So you can look this up, Kennewick Man, and what it had looked like somewhere. And it looks a lot like the depictions of the Sumerian people, which I showed you a Sumerian connection to South America not too long ago. So, like, share, and subscribe, guys. Appreciate you. More to come.